Chapter 10 of Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2015. Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Chapter 10 The Condition of India continued the hindus and the mohammedans editor your last question is a serious one and yet on careful consideration it will be found to be easy of solution the question arises because of the presence of the railways of the lawyers and of the doctors we shall presently examine the last two we have already considered the railways i should however like to add that man is so made by nature as to require him to restrict his movements as far as his hands and feet will take him if we did not rush about from place to place by means of railways and such other maddening conveniences much of the confusion that arises would be obviated our difficulties are of our own creation god set a limit to a man's locomotive ambition in the construction of his body man immediately proceeded to discover means of overriding the limit god gifted man with intellect that he might know his maker man abused it so he might forget his maker i am so constructed that i can only serve my immediate neighbors but in my conceit i pretend to have discovered that i must with my body serve every individual in the universe in thus attempting the impossible man comes in contact with different natures different religions and is utterly confounded according to this reasoning it must be apparent to you that railways are a most dangerous institution man has therethrough gone further away from his maker reader but i am impatient to hear your answer to my question has the introduction of mohammedanism not unmade the nation editor india cannot cease to be one nation because people belonging to different religions live in it the introduction of foreigners does not necessarily destroy the nation they merge in it a country is one nation only when such a condition obtains in it that country must have a faculty for assimilation india has ever been such a country in reality there are as many religions as there are individuals but those who are conscious of the spirit of nationality do not interfere with one another's religion if they do they are not fit to be considered a nation if the hindus believe that india should be peopled only by hindus they are living in dreamland the hindus the mohammedans the parsis and the christians who have made india their country are fellow countrymen and they will have to live in unity if only for their own interest in no part of the world are one nationality and one religion synonymous terms nor has it ever been so in india reader but what about the inborn enmity between hindus and mohammedans editor that phrase has been invented by our mutual enemy when the hindus and mohammedans fought against one another they certainly spoke in that strain they have long since ceased to fight how then can there be any inborn enmity pray remember this too that we did not cease to fight only after british occupation the hindus flourished under moslem sovereigns and moslems under the hindu each party recognized that mutual fighting was suicidal and that neither party would abandon its religion by force of arms both parties therefore decided to live in peace with the english advent the quarrels recommenced the proverbs you have quoted were coined when both were fighting to quote them now is obviously harmful should we not remember that many hindus and mohammedans own the same ancestors and the same blood runs through their veins do people become enemies because they change their religion is the god of the mohammedan different from the god of the hindu religions are different roads converging to the same point what does it matter that we take different roads as long as we reach the same goal 
wherein is the cause for quarrelling moreover there are deadly proverbs as between the followers of shiva and those of vishnu yet nobody suggests that these two do not belong to the same nation it is said that the vedic religion is different from jainism but the followers of the respective faiths are not different nations the fact is that we have become enslaved and therefore quarrel and like to have our quarrels decided by a third party there are hindu iconoclasts as there are mohammedan the more we advance in true knowledge the better we shall understand that we need not be at war with those whose religion we may not follow reader now i would like to know your views about cow protection editor i myself respect the cow that is i look upon her with affectionate reverence the cow is the protector of india because it being an agricultural country is dependent on the cow's progeny she is a most useful animal in hundreds of ways our mohammedan brethren will admit this but just as i respect the cow so do i respect my fellow men a man is just as useful as a cow no matter whether he be a mohammedan or a hindu am i then to fight with or kill a mohammedan in order to save a cow in doing so i would become an enemy as well of the cow as of the mohammedan therefore the only method i know of protecting the cow is that i should approach my mohammedan brother and urge him for the sake of the country to join me in protecting her if he would not listen to me i should let the cow go for the simple reason that the matter is beyond my ability if i were over full of pity for the cow i should sacrifice my life to save her but not take my brother's this i hold is the law of our religion when men become obstinate it is a difficult thing if i pull one way my moslem brother will pull another if i put on a superior air he will return the compliment if i bow to him gently he will do it much more so and if he does not i shall not be considered to have done wrong in having bowed when the hindus become insistent the killing of cows increased in my opinion cow protection societies may be considered cow killing societies it is a disgrace to us that we should need such societies when we forgot how to protect cows i suppose we needed such societies what am i to do when a blood brother is on the point of killing a cow am i to kill him or to fall down at his feet and implore him if you admit that i should adopt the latter course i must do the same to my moslem brother who protects the cow from destruction by hindus when they cruelly ill-treat her whoever reasons with the hindus when they mercilessly belabor the progeny of the cow with their sticks but this has not prevented us from remaining one nation lastly if it be true that the hindus believe in the doctrine of non-killing and the mohammedans do not what i pray is the duty of the former is it not written that a follower of the religion of ahimsa non-killing may kill a fellow man for him the way is straight in order to save one being he may not kill another he can only plead therein lies his sole duty but does every hindu believe in ahimsa going to the root of the matter not one man really practices such a religion because we do destroy life we are said to follow that religion because we want to obtain freedom from liability to kill any kind of life generally speaking we may observe that many hindus partake of meat and are not therefore followers of ahimsa it is therefore preposterous to suggest that the two cannot live together amicably because the hindus believe in ahimsa and the mohammedans do not these thoughts are put into our minds by selfish and false religious teachers the english put the finishing touch they have a habit of writing history they pretend to study the manners and customs of all peoples god has given us a limited mental capacity but they usurp the function of the godhead and indulge in novel experiments they write about their own researches in most laudatory terms 
and hypnotize us into believing them. We, in our ignorance, then fall at their feet. Those who do not wish to misunderstand things may read up the Quran and will find therein hundreds of passages acceptable to the Hindus, and the Bhagavad Gita contains passages to which not a Mohammedan can take exception. Am I to dislike a Mohammedan because there are passages in the Quran I do not understand or like? It takes two to make a quarrel. If I do not want to quarrel with a Mohammedan, the latter will be powerless to foist a quarrel on me, and, similarly, I should be powerless if a Mohammedan refuses his assistance to quarrel with me. An arm striking the air will become disjointed. If everyone will try to understand the core of his own religion and adhere to it, and will not allow false teachers to dictate to him, there will be no room left for quarrelling. Reader, but will the English ever allow the two bodies to join hands? Editor, this question arises out of your timidity. It betrays our shallowness. If two brothers want to live in peace, is it possible for a third party to separate them? If they were to listen to evil counsels, we would consider them to be foolish. Similarly, we Hindus and Mohammedans would have to blame our folly rather than the English, if we allowed them to put us asunder. A clay pot would break through impact, if not with one stone, then with another. The way to save the pot is not to keep it away from the danger point, but to bake it so that no stone would break it. We have then to make our hearts to perfectly baked clay. Then we shall be steeled against all danger. This can be easily done by the Hindus. They are superior in numbers. They pretend that they are more educated. They are, therefore, better able to shield themselves from attack on their amicable relations with the Mohammedans. There is mutual distrust between the two communities. The Mohammedans, therefore, ask for certain concessions from Lord Morley. Why should the Hindus oppose this? If the Hindus desisted, the English would notice it, the Mohammedans would gradually begin to trust the Hindus, and brotherliness would be the outcome. We should be ashamed to take our quarrels to the English. Everyone can find out for himself that the Hindus can lose nothing by desisting. That man who has inspired confidence in another has never lost anything in this world. I do not suggest that the Hindus and the Mohammedans will never fight. Two brothers living together often do so. We shall sometimes have our heads broken. Such a thing ought not to be necessary, but all men are not equi-minded. When people are in a rage, they do many foolish things. These we have to put up with. But when we do quarrel, we certainly do not want to engage counsel and to resort to English or any law courts. Two men fight. Both have their heads broken, or one only. How shall a third party distribute justice amongst them? Those who fight may expect to be injured. End of chapter 10